Little did he realize they'd land in his face. And yours. The gang's all here. And the soup's on. The Extraordinary Life of Soupy Sales. Next on Biography. Hello, I'm Jack Perkins. Welcome to Biography. He had the biggest, meanest dog in the USA. He had a lion who cursed in Italian. And a hippo who danced the cha-cha. And when he wasn't talking to this menagerie, he was usually <laughs> getting a pie in the face. With soupy sales, it was slapstick all the way. No messages, no lessons, except maybe learning new dances like the mouse. Or hearing such sage-like advice as, be true to your teeth and they won't be false to you. <laughs> in the gone but not forgotten staple of early television, the local kid show, soupy sales was and is. A legend. I want to say a great big hello now to all the kids all over the United States. And my name is Soupy Sales. From 1955 to 1966, this was one of the most recognized faces on television. His name? Soupy Sales. Since the beginning of time, I've known Soupy Sales. I grew up with him. I've always wanted to say that. People say that to me. I grew up with Soupy Sales. Did you do that to him? No, no. No, no, wait a minute. He broke ground, he set a trend, he was an original, there's never been anybody like him. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, what would you do if you were in my shoes? I'd polish him. <laughs> well, I would. Everybody watched Soupy, and everybody took something out of their show for themselves. Whether they were children or whether they were adults, everybody got something out of one of his shows. And usually it was a good belly laugh. Hey, don't you know pie at me, see? I bought all the Soupy Sales toys, the lunchbox, the comic books, the coloring book, the record albums. I mean, it was the Soupy Sales foundation. With a manic blend of vaudeville shtick, corny jokes, dreadful puns, and invisible dogs, Soupy Sales sculpted an indelible legend for himself in the memories of a generation of young viewers. A legend made mostly of pies. Oh. See you, folks. Blew. Soupy Sales was born on January the 8th, 1926, in Franklinton, North Carolina, not far from Wake Forest. He was Irving and Sadie Suppin's third son. They called him Milton. His two older brothers, Leonard and Jack, had the nicknames Hambone and Chickenbone. After a while, everyone began calling little Milton Soupbone. The name stuck. The Supmans were the only Jewish family in an area of long-standing racial prejudice, led by the Ku Klux Klan. But the three young Supman Bones quickly learned the value of humor in diffusing the world of intolerance which surrounded them. I had run into some prejudices. You have to as a kid. And to overcome those prejudices, you do something to give, take away from that. I believe that. And I think it was a thing of wanting to be accepted. When Irving Supman died of tuberculosis in 1931, little Soup Bone was barely five. He was a bright but lonely boy who would find company in his vivid imagination. His mother realized she couldn't run the dry goods store that they owned and still fend for her three boys by herself. So Sadie remarried in 1934 to Felix Goldstein, a traveling salesman, and the family moved to Huntington, West Virginia, where Soupy would receive his first taste of real applause as the star of a grade school production of the play Peter Rabbit. And to hear the laughter, and I sang a song to hear applause, something struck me. I said, my God, that's what I want to do and want to be. I know I wanted to perform. As is the case with all great performers, there were deeper needs in little Milton Supman, needs that only laughter could cure. Well, I spent a lot of time by myself, and my mother would go to work at 7 in the morning, come back at 7 at night, and on Saturday I would go to the movies and wait there for it. I'd be half asleep. She'd come by and pick me up and take me home. I think that's why I wanted to become a performer. It gave me a chance to relate to other people, and I always was doing that. That was a way to attract attention, to do that. Frequent trips to the local movie theater kindled a growing ambition in the young Soupy. 
the madcap on-screen antics of the Keystone Cops, Buster Keaton, the Marx Brothers, and the Ritz Brothers would begin to mold his imagination. Sufi's influences, I think, were Chaplin, Buster Keaton, and I'm sure the Marx Brothers, the zaniness of the Marx Brothers. I feel like I'm in a Marx Brothers uh, act when I see Soupy's act sometimes when he gets rolling. A physical comedy was always appealing to me because I felt very physical in those days, and I liked that physical aspect from seeing, you know, early movies of the Marx Brothers and the Ritz Brothers. As Soupy was starting to fit in in his new town, his dreams of performing began to take shape and his impetuous, infectious humor was starting to score points with his schoolmates, who voted him the most popular boy in school. He was a class clown, but uh, he, he, doesn't he never dwelled on his childhood or his teenage years. I think he was in jail all that time. I don't think I was a class clown. I probably had more personality than most people because I think I was in senior classes voted the, the, one of the kids with most personality. I guess I was pretty funny running around there, but, you know, if you look like me, you got to be funny. Upon his graduation from high school, Soupy enrolled at Marshall College as a journalism major. But World War II was raging, and at the end of his first semester at Marshall, Soupy paid a visit to his local draft board. When the war broke out, I was the first one to volunteer down to draft board. But they said they already had enough members on the draft board. They said, you're going in the service. I went, oh, I thought it worked the other way around. And they said, well, put your name. I said, thank you. And I went in the Navy. During more than two years of active service aboard the USS Randall, Seaman First Class Milton Soupy Supman first tried his hand at broadcasting. Although it was only via the ship's onboard intercom system, it was a start. I had a chance to do shows aboard ship because you had a captive audience. They weren't going to walk out on you unless they were planning to swim to you, lift the islands. We were out there, out there in the enemy waters, and you played, tried to keep up the morale. And that's the point. It was out there, in enemy waters, preparing for the invasion of Okinawa, that the aspiring writer began to discover his affinity for a microphone. And along with a radio transcription, a V-disc, he began to create one of his most memorable characterizations. I'd always been a big fan of Jack London and White Fang, and I always pictured this dog as being a friend of mine and, like, would be, you know, but, like, you couldn't control him. And I didn't know how I was going to work it until one night I was playing Hound of the Baskervilles for the intercom over the whole ship. And when Sherlock Holmes got involved with the dogs, and I said, there's White Fang, and I stole that disc. And every time I'd do a radio show, I'd play, yeah, yeah. I said, sit down, boy, yeah, yeah. You know, and I'd kick over the waste baskets and the chairs. Yeah. I said, he's attacking me. And they say, is he nuts? Get down, get down, boy, get down. Get down, white fang, get down, get down. Stupid, I'll kick you in the earlobe. Get down, boy. At the end of get his down, tour in the Navy, using his benefits under the GI Bill, Soupy Supman, now 20, re-enrolled at Marshall. It was here at college that he met and wed Barbara Fox. Still bitten by the bug to perform, he attempted to begin a career in radio. I went to one radio station, and, and it was 250-watt radio station. So I, went, I said, I'll get a job. He says, you got to start a smaller station. I said, there's nothing smaller than 250-watt. And he threw me right out on the sidewalk, right there. And I walked across the street, and it was WHTN. And the guy said, well, he says, we'll give you a job. You can write in continuity. The writer turned copywriter wasn't content with his new career without another crack at the microphone. He began broadcasting from the campus on WHTN for free and would play roadhouses, sometimes hitchhiking up to 80 miles for a mere 15 or $20. The money wasn't important. The experience was. It was during these early years that Soupy decided to change his last name to Hines after a popular soup company of the time, in keeping with the soup bone, soupy trademark he had adopted. But despite the fun he was having at WHTN, it wouldn't be long before he would make the first of his many moves in the industry. He decided to take a job in Cincinnati. It was his first big break in television. When they fired the manager of the station, George Bringle, he went to Cincinnati to WKRC-TV, the Taft station, and despite the station, he calls me up and he says, would you like to do, get into TV? And I said, yes. So I quit my job and went to Cincinnati, 
and I did a show called Soupy Soda Shop. It was the first teenage dance show before they ever had American Bandstand. The unique style and rapid-fire delivery he had developed in the clubs and on the radio translated perfectly to television. And it wasn't too long before he was moving again. This time in May of 1951 to WXEL in Cleveland, where he had a date with destiny. An appointment with a feather, a loincloth, an unmanageable horse, and a pie. I got down there, and this horse, this farmer had brought a stallion. And, he, and, and they said, you got two minutes. So I had to get on the horse, and I said, where's the saddle? And the farmer says, Indians didn't wear saddles. I said, when did you become the technical advisor for this project? He said, and they said, get on that horse. I said, OK. I walk up. I did my line. Soldier, come to Indian country. You kill our buffalo. You kill our antelope. You shoot our deer. What is left for the Indian? And he hits me in the face with a pie. And I said, that not him what I had in mind. That was the first pie I took. Biographies look at the life of Soupy Sales will continue. <laughs>